most of the data projects that I've uh, been involved in have been through Help Me Investigate, and um, they generally involved some sort of um, freedom of information request and then trying to uh, make sense of the resulting data. Uh, a more recent one would be The Scotsman, which is a Scottish newspaper. Um, someone there wanted to get hold of, uh, or really bring together schools data, data about uh, what's known as free school meals in schools, and this was scattered around a number of web pages. So in that case, um, uh, my role was to gather that data together, write a scraper, and to advise on the um, visualization of that, combine it with other data, so I'll get some geographical data on on, on that. Um, so I, it, it, quite often I tend to have um, an involvement at a particular stage of someone else's data project, really. So someone else asks a question, I will help them either obtain the data, um, and that might be through an FOI request or through getting data out of PDFs or scrape it, writing a scraper. Um, it might be that I'm asked about the visualization of data, so what's the best way to communicate it. Um, those tend to be the two most common areas where I'm, where I'm involved in. I guess the one that sticks in my mind, and this is one that I had less involvement in really was uh, was a, a story about the, the street in Birmingham that um, had the most parking tickets. So what was the worst street in Birmingham to park on? Um, and that involved an FOI request. Uh, most of the data analysis though actually was done by a, a, another guy called Neil, uh, Neil Houston, who's actually not a journalist but is a forensic accountant. Um, and that, that resulted in a, in a big double page spread in the Birmingham Post um, with an, a nice map of the kind of the, the, the worst places in Birmingham. What was particularly interesting about that, I think, for me was that um, you had to try and unpick the, the subtleties of the data. So you might have one street which had lots of parking tickets on it, but it's a very, very long street. It's a road that runs all the way through. And you might have a very small street that, that doesn't have many um, at first glance, but when you kind of see how many there are per foot, for example, or per metre, then that, that's a more interesting story. Um, then there was a human element to it. So there was one particular um, individual ticket, uh, ticket inspector who um, issued a, a tremendous number of tickets, and I think something like double the, the next nearest um, parking uh, ticket inspector. So um, so, so it, it revealed a number of interesting stories in that way. It's, it's a very kind of, and it was a very accessible story, you know, something that, that a lot of people can can relate to. And more recently, Jess Winch at um, the Birmingham Mail um, kind of followed up with a, a, a similar story on um, what had happened when the council had increased the time during which people could be ticketed and how many tickets were issued during that period and whether people were, were being ticketed um, without them knowing that they were, that they were parking illegally. Um, and so uh, basically there was a huge leap in the number of tickets being issued, and three quarters of that leap was due to this extra hour and the numbers of people being ticketed then. So there's a, a strong suggestion that people were being, that the council hadn't done enough to communicate this. The worst streets in Birmingham, that, that obviously lent itself very much to a map. Um, you know, people would want to know about, for example, they might not know the name of a particular street, but they, they know where they park or where they might want to park. So, um, uh, maps can be overused, really, but in that in that case, it was a, it was a pretty obvious choice, um, and that uh, in that case, the map was made by Dave Higgerson from Trinity Mirror um, Publishing. Um, for the uh, rise in parking tickets, um, the more recent story that that was one of those situations where. There was a temptation to go for something really, you know, a particularly fancy type of, of visualization. And actually, um, you're, you're looking at um, composition 
you're looking at change over time. So I, so I eventually went for a, a stacked bar chart. So you could see, and, and I'll try and find a, uh, a link to that, but you can then see quite clearly the, the leap from one year to the next um, and how much of that is, is um, down to one particular hour and a half, for example. When you're choosing a visualisation, it's important to... Um, to think about what you're trying to communicate. If you're trying to communicate a change over time, then a line chart or a bar chart may be appropriate. If you're looking at composition, uh, then it, sometimes a pie, pie chart will work, although pie charts um, aren't brilliant. Um, tree maps are much better, for example. Um, and, and I could go on about different types of visualisation, but, but it's... The starting point should always be, what am I trying to communicate, not um, I want to use a map. I think as a, as, a, as a journalist, when you start to gather data, you have a particular hypothesis, for example. Um, but even if, if the data doesn't support that hypothesis, then uh, you, you should obviously change your hypothesis and see what other stories it tells. But really, the talent of a journalist is to find those stories, and, and there are always stories and data, I say, I say that, um, I'm sure I'll be proved wrong at some point, but, you know, you know, journalists are very good at finding interesting things where many other people would not find anything interesting. So at the very basic level, who's top, who's bottom, um, what's changed over time, what are the changes over space, you know, are the regional differences. Um, those are all things that, that data often brings to light. And <clears throat> with, with online publishing as well, sometimes it's just about being useful. There doesn't ha have to be a story there. So um, when I scraped this free school meal data, there wasn't necessarily any story there immediately, but, but it was about gathering that data into one place and being able to... Um, put something out there that people could then interrogate further and you could see patterns in terms of urban versus rural and things like that um, but that wasn't really the point of that particular piece of work and and sometimes I guess we should be careful at saying um, that we failed um, if we haven't found a story because <clears throat> simply gathering data together in one place making it accessible um, is is really quite an important role, I think, that journalism has to play increasingly so um, as people are able to do things with this and ask their own questions. So, you know, the, the very first stage, the, 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 the first criteria of success is can I get hold of the data and, and publish it? Then can I find stories within it? And then can I find deeper stories? Because, you know, what's top, what's bottom what's changed over time. Um, those are pretty superficial um, and easy win stories, but then there, there are deeper stories that I think we should be doing more towards. The most obvious source of, of data that, that every journalist should be subscribed to is the, their particular country's uh, Office of National Statistics or whatever body um, publishes and, and brings together uh, national data sets, governmental data sets. Um, in, in the UK we have the Office of National Statistics but we also have data.gov.uk and both tend to publish the same data sets, there's a lot of overlap and then individual departments will also publish their own data sets. Um, so, so there's a lot of overlaps there but I would start with the kind of national aggregators and then also any particular departments that you're covering. So if you're covering health, education, then, then following their department's um, data releases and statistical releases. Um, then I would, I would be uh, looking at any kind of freedom of information um, sources, um, any open uh, information transparency laws, and this will vary from country to country, but in many countries, um, there are tools where you can submit these and, and you can follow what's being submitted. Some bodies will publish what are called in the UK disclosure logs. So they'll say what 
uh, FOI requests they've had. And, and if you follow those, then um, you'll know what data's already been supplied and you can ask for a copy of that. Um, but it also gives you ideas for stories and data sets that you wouldn't otherwise know of. And it, and it also introduces you to jargon, which you might not be aware of. And jargon is very important in data journalism because, you know, there, there may be a term used within a particular industry uh, that, that you need to know in order to get that data, either directly or indirectly through search. Um, so that's two sources, and I guess the third source would be uh, open data movements and projects. Um, so in the UK, for example, we have a, a guy called Chris Taggart, who's done a lot of open data initiatives. He's done Openly Local, which gathers together local government data. He's done Open Charities, which is charity data, and he does Open Corporates, which is company data, worldwide, actually. Um, and, it, you know, knowing about those open data initiatives can lead you to data sets and, and more easily linked data sets than simply going through the official routes. And there, there are quite healthy open data communities that in, you know, all around the world. And it's, it's just, it may be that you simply don't know about them, but you certainly should. The first thing, I think, is how granular the data is so how detailed is it if the data is only at a national level for example that's not very helpful if it's at a regional level then that's better if it's down to a street level then even better still you know and, and the more detail the better and, and you should always ask for, for data at the most detailed level you can um, because you you want to combine and recombine and connect data in different ways um, so, you know, for example, just having a postcode or a latitude and longitude um, makes a big difference in, in that respect. Um, the other thing I'd look for is uh, any kind of codes or classification. Um, that can be really important because uh, classifications do sometimes change over time. And if you're comparing things... Um, over a period of time, for example, then if you see a huge leap or a huge drop at a particular point of time, it may simply be that the classification of a region um, has changed at that point. You know, boundaries get redrawn, um, definitions change, uh, initiatives um, are, are introduced and are an end. Um, even simple things like the devices that individuals use to collect data, if new handsets are issued to uh, ticket inspectors, for example, that can make a big difference in terms of how the data is gathered and classified. So, so classification is really, really important, and, and you know you should always pick up the phone if you've got a, a, a something unusual in the data. You should always pick up the phone and, and check what happened at this point. Um, did anything change? Um, and um, another thing to check, particularly if you've got it at, at a very detailed level, is to try and correlate what you've got in, in a data set with what you with individual instances. Um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism did this very successfully recently when they looked at deaths in police custody. And when they actually, first of all, they had to fight very hard to get the data. When they got it, they then compared it with the uh, reported deaths in police custody and inquests and things like that, uh, coroner's reports. And they found that there were a lot of deaths that weren't recorded in the statistics. And this was because the police had used a very, very narrow definition of, of what was classified as a death in police custody and what was classified as custody. Um, for example, so uh, things like that, you know, matching up reports, uh, news reports and official reports with the, the data, um, that in itself can lead to very big stories, uh, very important stories, because these are, um, you know, this, this data is what a lot of political decisions, budgeting decisions are made on. So, uh, so that's another key thing. Um, and then the, how clean the data is, um, you're looking to see whether 
it's whether classification, for example, is consistent, that the, the same terms are used, whether there are typing errors, extra spaces, punctuation, um, different terms used for the same objects, things like that. I think you, the best way is to use a number of techniques together. Um, the, the obvious ones to begin with are just sorting, which you'd want to do anyway to see what's top, what's bottom. And if there's a really, really unusually big number at the top, for example, then, you know, rather than get excited about some big story, it may be that someone has accidentally typed an extra zero or three on the, um, or missed a decimal place, for example. Um, so sorting can be useful. Um, then there are specific tools like Google Refine, and you can use Google Refine to search for uh, extra spaces, for uh, trailing and leading spaces, so where someone's put a space at the beginning or the end of, a, of, a, of an entry. Um, you can look for uh, what are called HTML entities, so if something's been scraped from a, from a web page or the data has been entered online, sometimes you'll get HTML code in the and you need to uh, convert that back to a character. And Google Refine will do that for you. Um, this is a, a free piece of software that you can download. Um, uh, the other thing that Google Refine will do is cluster. So it will, it will um, find data that looks very similar but shares certain characteristics, and it will say to you, are these the same thing? Um, so that's another. And then there's always an element of manual work. So, for example, one common problem with data I come across is where you have uh, an organization, for example, which is referred to as uh, an acronym like the BBC and its full title, so British Broadcasting Corporation. Google Refine, Excel, they won't pick that up. Um, that's that's really something you need to look for in uh, yourself. Now, you don't necessarily have to do that at the start of the data. It may be something you, you only come across when you come to the, the kind of the story itself. So as you're starting to round up these figures and you find, oh, right, well, the BBC is second uh, best or second worst for something, it's only then that you might think, well, could the BBC be here elsewhere on the British Broadcasting Corporation? And you, and you start to look at that, for example. Um, so <clears throat> it's not always necessary that the entire data set is completely clean. Uh, as you narrow down to your particular angle, your, what you're particularly interested in, that's where you need to be more and more confident that you have cleaned that particular subsection and, and you have all the data that, that, um, that is relevant. Most of the cleaning you can do up front. Um, it's just, uh, I think that when you get closer and closer to your story, there may be more manual cleaning that you start to uh, start to do. Um, and as you kind of look around your data set and explore it, um, you know, it's always a good idea when you first get your data set to, to just scroll through it, you know, sort it in different ways and scroll through it and see what jumps out at you. Um, you know, a good, a good example recently, I was looking at a local government um, uh, spending uh, spreadsheet and, uh, you know, just scrolling through it, I noticed that there was a taxi company there. So then I started to think, well, what different names might a taxi company have? You know, the, they might not necessarily call themselves taxi hire. It might be private hire. It could be transport. It could be cars, for example. Um, so you start to kind of think around different ways that, that a particular type of data might be described and then use filters to kind of drill down to that. Advanced search is probably the, the still the most useful in terms of just um, using file type and site to limit the, the results, um, using jargon, using uh, exact phrases, um, those all tend to be useful. I'm trying to think of uh, searching for databases uh, rather than the data itself and, and then trying to get uh, see how I can get hold of the data within the databases. Um, and just, I guess, guess it, being in the habit of bookmarking data sets whenever I come across them. So uh, 
So because I do that, if I need to find data on something, then sometimes it's just a case of going into my delicious bookmarks and using a combination of tags. Um, that's another another thing I think, which is I guess is effectively like having a data cuttings file. I'd start with Excel, so I'd start with file type XLS. Um, then I'd try PDF, um, possibly Word, possibly PowerPoint even. Sometimes I've, in one particular occasion, um, we were looking, this wasn't actually related to data, but um, you, can, you can obviously get tables in a PowerPoint file that may have been presented internally, um, but are not uh, intended to be public. And so you can you can stumble across data sometimes. The that's only likely to succeed, I think, if if you know exactly what you're looking for, um, and you can't find it anywhere else. But um, so it's it's kind of a you know it's a, a a list a tick list of kind of saying well I'll, I'll try it'd be brilliant if it was in Excel, but if not. I'll settle for PDF, and if not, I'll settle for Word, or I'll settle for CSV. Or um, One thing that does occur to me is when you've got data stored on Google Docs and on BuzzData and places like that, whether you need to incorporate that, because that won't show up as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I'm not even sure if it would show up as a CSV. I keep meaning to check that. But, um, but that may be a possible blind spot. I think there's a danger of, of journalists um, thinking they do have to do it all themselves. Um, and that, that can lead them to either not try it in the first place because it seems too hard or to, to not involve other people and, and do journalism of poorer quality as a result. So, yes, I, I, think, they sh I think journalists should always seek help um, from others in areas where they're not entirely confident. But I also think they should try things themselves. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard to acquire a, a basic level in a lot of these skills. Um, I think probably one area, you know, visualization, for example, is, is, um, to, to do it well needs a lot of skill. Uh, scraping, you, you're likely to need help from other people. Um, sometimes statistical kind of uh, literacy and, and, um, and a check on that. It's always useful to have a second eye on these things to kind of say, am I getting this story right? Am I missing something, uh, a subtlety in the data in the way that it's been measured and, and recorded? Um, so, um, but also, like I said, you know, just putting the data out there and saying, what can you see that I can't? What can you visualize that I can't? Which would the Guardian do? I think that has a lot of value. If I'm um, scraping something that's quite small scale um, and it's quite easy to scrape, so if it's already on a, in a table, on a web page, then I will just use Google Docs and I'll use a, a, an import uh, HTML function. Or if it's uh, not in a table but, there, but it's on a, a web page or a series of web pages and there are no more than 50, then I will use import XML, which uses uh, a language called XPath. Um, then if, if uh, that won't do the job if it's uh, more complicated or bigger than that then um, I might use a tool like Outwit Hub um, which uh, doesn't involve writing any language at all um, or I would have used a, a tool called Needlebase which um, is being closed down unfortunately it was bought by Google and they're now closing it um, I'm trying to think what else um, there's Yahoo pipes as well, but then basically, if none of those are going to be straightforward, then I'll use Python um, and I'll use ScraperWiki uh, to write that Python. Um, 
so yes, I've played a little bit around with Ruby, and at some point I'll come back to that. But but mainly it's Python. And I don't think it will enable lots of journalists to do it because there is still a, a a big technical barrier to be overcome in terms of understanding um, how a language like Python works, uh, how HTML works, and some of the um, you know. But there's there's a process which you go through even in adapting someone else's scraper and understanding someone else's scraper um, which is a skill in itself you know to be able to say oh well what's that how do I find out what that is um, you know that that's a skill in itself and and that's a big barrier to get over which most journalists won't be able to um, what I do I think I think the main barriers that that scraper wiki removes um, is needing to have your own uh, development environment which is a which is actually a very big barrier you know you can learn all the Python you want of a Ruby or PHP uh, but unless you you know you actually setting up your computer to run as a server or setting up a remote server those things are a different thing entirely so it's, it's you know that, that um, makes a big difference um, and then the kind of making it easier to see other scrapers and to, and to understand how they work. I think that um, that removes a barrier as well. So for those who have some understanding, um, and some of them, you know, the, the kind of basic Twitter scraper, you can show to someone and all they have to do is change the URL and it should still work. So those kinds of templates can be very useful as well. But I actually think the way it seems to have developed is that it's, it's mainly... Uh, made it easier for journalists to ask other people to scrape things for them. Um, it's provided a community and an access to that community for journalists and between journalists and, and developers and activists. Um, so that community is probably its biggest achievement rather than the technical side of things. Um, and, um, and they seem to have moved away from actually looking at journalists as much as they are looking at the developer community. It's um, very easy to scrape, scrape a single page. It's harder to scrape a sequence of pages. It's, uh, you have another barrier if you need to loop through a number of pages which aren't linked together. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a structure in the URL and you need to loop through a number of URLs, but um, you need to create, generate those URLs yourself. Um, then there are pages which are hidden behind forms, and that involves using it with Python the, me the mechanized um, library. Um, there are pages that are um, held in, in, you need cookies basically, and, and uh, ASP, there's PDFs. Um, so so all, you get all kinds of barriers, and that makes scraping more and more difficult, depending on your own experiences. Um, but um, but I can't think of anything that's impossible. I can think of things which are difficult, um, and ASPX is, is, an, is notoriously difficult, but it's still possible. It's just, it's just um, challenging. Um, so, yes, I, th I think the bigger danger really is not necessarily the technical barrier, but what, uh, first of all, finding where that information is, and secondly, um, uh, once you've got that data, actually, for example, if it's, if it's cost you a lot of work to get hold of that data, it's very easy to think, right, um, I've worked hard to get this data, and now I've got the, the ultimate facts. And sometimes it can be that, um, that the data is flawed or, you know, it's missing information. And that there are, um, and this is where journalists particularly come into play, I think, is where they can take that data and compare it against other reports. Um, sometimes if you, the amount of time you spend picking up the phone and chasing people on the phone might actually be more time than it takes to do a very simple scraper. Um, you know, so but but a lot of the time picking up the phone will uh, well not a lot of the time but some of the time it, it will be a good way to do it. And I mean another way is to do an advanced search and see if there are any uh, spreadsheets or um, or um, other data that's that's already been published.
and we should be aware that there are ethical considerations in scraping. You know, if you are scraping a website, then you are making a demand on that website. You uh, and if you've done it badly, you can slow down that website. Uh, you can get shut out. Um, so there are implications of scraping, which may, I mean, there, there, you'd have to think of an extreme example of scraping, which would, uh, where the public interest uh, wouldn't um, prevail. Um, but so yes, I, th I think on the whole, if it's if it's information that's publicly accessible. Um, then you, or, if, or even if it's not publicly accessible and there's a public interest reason for doing so, then you, you are entitled to scrape it, yes. When desktop publishing first came about, you had everyone trying all of the tools. PowerPoint, you know, you remember an age with PowerPoint where all the bullets zoomed in with a whooshing sound and you had all kinds of transitions. Video editing software, you know, fancy transitions and so on in the 80s. Uh, Photoshop gradients, drop shadows, you can go through a history of these these awful um, things that everyone has seen and done and I've done it myself, I remember doing an animated GIF which did this whole colour thing and I'm, I'm ashamed of it now but um, it always happens and, and visualisation in infographics is exactly the same, everyone's trying everything and a lot of it is awful, but we have to make those mistakes in order to find out what works. Um, and, you know, for every good experiment, there are going to be ten bad ones. But, um, but it's still exciting to, to, to look at that and, and, to, and you know, seeing what, what is awful actually teaches you a hell of a lot. Um, ultimately, it is about um, what is newsworthy, the angle, and how that is communicated. Um, and the confidence in uh, th that story, in the, in the specifics of the story, you know, the who, what, where, why and when, not the whole of the data, but what the specific part of the data that is the story.